Good morning, everyone. I think we will go ahead and, and get started. And uh, I guess good morning for those of us here in Washington, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. I'd like to welcome you all to the first in our Engendering International Waters webinar series. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sarah Davidson, the Manager for Water Policy at WWF. We'll start off with a few just logistical and technical details. You might have noticed, but just to help with sound quality, all of you will be muted upon your entry to the webinar. We still welcome communication with you. So at the top right of your WebEx screen, you should find two different boxes that you can type into. Please use the chat box if you have any technical difficulties at all. We'll be monitoring that and we'll try to help you. You'll also hopefully find a box that's labeled Q and A. And there are a couple of times during our agenda today where you will have the chance to ask questions or to share comments and reflections. Please feel free to type questions or comments at any time during the webinar, and we'll take questions from there during those discussion portions. So you don't need to hold those as you're thinking of them throughout. Feel free to type them in. Lastly, I do want to make sure to note that this webinar is being recorded. We want to be able to share it with anyone who misses it or in case any of you would find it useful to revisit a portion of the webinar again, but just want to make sure you are aware that we will be recording it. So to jump into why we're holding this webinar series in the first place, so Jeff recognizes that gender equality is an important goal in the context of all of its projects. Jeff does have a gender policy, as hopefully you all know, and every Jeff project is expected to design gender responsive approaches and incorporate gender mainstreaming. And there's a growing consensus on the many reasons why it is especially important to mainstream gender in the water realm, including the fact that a more balanced involvement and participation of men and women in water programs will improve the success and increase the impact of every water program, regardless of its specific area of focus. Based on the relevance of gender and water-related matters at all levels, from household practices to governance issues, the Jeff-funded IW Learn project has included in its fourth cycle, which we're currently in, a gender subcomponent, with the scope of achieving increased recognition of gender issues and attention on gender equality throughout Jeff IW projects. So you can see on the screen here, the objectives of this subcomponent are to accelerate learning for the Jeff IW portfolio. We hope to provide access to training materials on common or important issues or challenges. And we would like to facilitate exchanges of experiences and online learning mechanisms on gender integration and use of gender indicators. So we do have a number of activities planned under the subcomponents. This is the first or the introductory webinar of a six webinar series. Michaela will walk us through the topics planned in just a moment. We will be putting together one animated video that will capture and present in a condensed way some key aspects of the water and gender interaction in a fun way. Um, we will have three face-to-face -face workshops. One actually took place last year at the Jeff IWC in Sri Lanka. Um, that was entitled Gender Equality for Improved Water Resource Management, Connecting SDG 5 and 6. Hopefully some of you may have been there, actually, and had the chance to participate in that first workshop. We'll have a bit more discussion on the upcoming plans for the remaining two face-to-face -face workshops planned later. And just a brief note on the target audience. Um, all of you who are on this call <laughs> likely fall into one of these categories. Um, the, the series and, in fact, the, all of the activities under the component will be designed for Jeff IW projects, project managers and technical staff of projects, um, the project implementing and executing agencies, as well as the project recipient country stakeholders. So that could be scientific institutes, or government bodies, could be basin organizations, civil society organizations and universities. And just a note on that last Part that we, we do count on you to share with your partners um, in the future. We'd love to have broader distribution, so we'd invite you to share invitations for webinars like this with those stakeholders to share the recording when we do share that and the resource materials with you as well.
And just a brief note that IWLEARN um, gender subcomponent is being executed by the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF, together with WAP. Thought it would be nice to introduce ourselves quickly. As you might know, WWF is the world's leading conservation NGO founded in 1961. We operate in over 100 countries and have around 5 million members. Our mission is to stop the degradation of the planet's natural environment and build a future in which humans live in harmony with nature. WWF has been a Jeff agency since 2012 and recently, um, just a couple of months ago, actually became a GCF agency as well. We have a very ambitious goal, you can see here, uh, guiding our work around fresh water, which is to secure water for people and nature in line with the SDGs. And in terms of our work on gender, WWF has more than three decades of experience implementing gender responsive conservation programming on the ground. So that's working closely with communities, with governments. We also work with the private sector to integrate gender and conservation projects. Our work is guided by our gender policy, which has been in place since 2011, as well as gender mainstreaming guidelines for the GEF and also for the GCF and USAID. Those are in the process of being updated to make them more broadly usable and to focus on continuing to really better operationalize our own policy. Across our network of around 100 offices, we have a group working on social development for conservation, we call it SD4C. This group houses our network gender task force and provides seminars and short courses, training for our staff. Here at WWF US, this is supported by a social community of practice, which focuses on that kind of capacity building. And we're lucky to have here at WWF US a senior gender specialist, Natalie Simono, who is on the call with us today, who provides dedicated support to projects and focuses particularly on the JAF, GCF, and USAID. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michaela, to introduce WAP. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. And good day, everybody, and welcome to the IW Learn Water and Gender webinar series. Uh, my name is Michaela Miletto, and uh, I work at WAP UNESCO. As Sarah mentioned, WAP and WWF are partners under the IW Learn project and jointly develop the activities of the gender subcomponent. Let me first briefly introduce WAP for those who are not familiar with. WAP stands for World Water Assessment Program. It is a program of UNESCO that has the main scope of assessing and reporting on the state, quality and quantity, use and management of fresh water resources worldwide. The main product, the most popular that probably you know of WAP is the WWDR, the World Water Development Report, which is the UN Water Flagship Report that results from the collaboration of 67 UN agencies and partners of UN Water. The report is annual and thematic with a specific theme that changes every year, coinciding with the theme of the International Water Day. In 2014, WAP started a major gender initiative to create a methodology and identify key indicators for collecting sex disaggregated water data together with 35 international experts that were part of the WAP expert group on sex disaggregated indicators. Based on this result, WAP produced the toolkit for water and gender assessment and monitoring. This was in 2014. <clears throat> From that time, the toolkit has gained official recognition and has been applied in different contexts. The UNCO, for instance, the African Minister Council, uh, was the first to recognize WAP indicators to be used in water assessment. Later on in 2016, the toolkit has received another recognition from the Commission on the Status of Women, and always in 2016, it has been officially included in the guidelines for gender and climate change of the UN framework for the Convention of Climate Change. Say so that, let's focus now on the IWLEARN webinar series. The scope of the webinar series is to inform GEF international water projects on the basic concept on water and gender issues, 
and on the tools available for conducting water and gender assessment as part but not exclusively of the foundational projects adopting the transboundary diagnostic analysis and the strategic action program methodology which is recommended by the international water focal areas of the GEF. The series will consist of six thematic webinars. Five of them will be de delivered in 2017, this year. As you can see from the table, the menu, the menu is quite rich from the webinar that describes new gender analytical tools like the WAP toolkit to another webinar, the one that has been planned on October, November, that will analyze the interlinkages between the goal five, the gender goal, and six on water, and how they can be reflected into the projects. Two other two webinars planned between May and October that will include the climate change into the discussion and the consequences of gender roles of women and men in the migration fluxes and water stress induced uh, displacement in particular from rural to urban areas. Timeline, timeline in the table indicate, indicate um, when the webinars are planned, but through IWLEARN we will inform you about a precise date ahead of time. And now, here is the outline on this first introductory uh, webinar. This webinar includes three presentations. The first will focus on the basic concept of gender, gender mainstreaming, and women empowerment. The second will introduce gender analysis and how it could be included in the GF International World Project. The third will present the other activities planned as part of the IWLEARN gender component, with particular focus on the other activities <coughs> and opportunities to cooperate with the IW project through the twinning. There will be discussion time, and uh, uh, we encourage you to share your needs and the challenges you're facing just to help us to fine tune with the project needs. And now I give the floor to Lesha Wismer. Probably you know her, is a senior gender expert recognized at the international level. She's also an advisor on sustainable development policies, water stewardship, water diplomacy, water governance, and many other <laughs> water issues. So Lesha, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michaela and Sarah. <clears throat> um, my name is Lesha. And thank you for the introduction. I would like to remind you that if you want, during our session, you can click on the um, chat box or on Q&A and post your um, questions or your remarks so we can um, uh, deal with that later on. Um, first, I would like you to have a little laugh and have a look at the graphs that you see. Because, as you will see, this is what happens a lot. The women are doing the work, but are not recognized um, for their uh, contribution. So, next slide, please. So, why is um, uh, water a gender and women's issue, and why does it connect SDG 6 and SDG 5? Well, for one, because water is key for economic development and independence. It means that if you have access to water, you are also able to spend your time differently or use it for your business or your uh, farming. Access to water and clean, um, clean water influences our health. It's not just about waterborne diseases, but it's also about health issues that you have when you have to carry too much water. Access to water and water quality influences access to education. These are two different um, uh, uh, parts of the same uh, coin. One is that, for instance, girls will and cannot go to school if there is no adequate sanitation or water but also teachers might not want to work in that particular area 
if there is not um, enough access to water and sanitation. So, what does all this mean for water um, in terms of equality and equity issues? And please be aware that these are crucial philosophies and concepts behind the SDGs. Now, equity is basically equal footing, process of fairness of treatment of men and women. Next slide. So, just to illustrate this to you, um, there is a, um, a somewhat um, playful illustration that is part of the water rooms, and especially one of the uh, videos that is called the Good Governance Recipe. We will make the link to this available to all of you um, through the web pages, which we will come back to at the end of this webinar. Uh, and we really would like you to uh, to watch it um, and enjoy it just as much as we do. Next slide, slide please. So this is one. The same status. Um, anyone equal opportunities. Now, if you look at this, this looks equal, but it doesn't create equality. So, next slide, please. So, here you see that simple measures, in this case, putting people on a different stool, will help everybody to be able to watch, to observe, and to participate. Now, of course, this is simplifying things, but I think it gets the message across. Next. In 1992, in Dublin, four very important principles were agreed on by the participants in that meeting. And basically that principle number three set the tone for everything that we now consider to be standard policies. It was the basis for Rio in 1992, for the Johannesburg um, um, World Summit on Sustainable Development, and now, of course, for especially SDG 5 and the connection we make to SDG 6. And what does it say? It says two important things. One is that women play a central role. And look at what it says, not just provision, but also management and safeguarding of water. And what it stresses is that women are not just the victims. But if you include them, they are the actors and can influence the sustainability of the programs. Next. So just so we're on the same page and remind you, when you look into policy documents and people making statements, what you see lots of times is that they use gender like it's equal to women. That's not the case. Gender is a social status. It depends on the roles that people recognize and play in society. And what it also can do, unfortunately, is emphasize the inequalities that are there. Because people get different types of treatment, different types of um, recognition, um, and it can, the whole set of roles come from the whole set of backgrounds. So it's not just cultural or just social or just economic or religious, but it's the whole set that in the end uh, decides what type of role you are playing. That also means that if you talk about women, their roles in society are not always the same. There are differences between women in developing countries, in rural areas, in the city, highly educated, lower educated. So you have to be aware that the gender roles not only differ from men to women and boys and girls, but also in the local circumstances that they live with. Next. 
Now, gender mainstreaming. <clears throat> mainstreaming itself is a process, and it's not a goal. It's trying to make sure that issues that normally don't get enough attention are getting part of the decision-making process. And of course, when, I, when it's about gender mainstreaming, it's not only a question of social justice and human rights, but it's a necessary process to make sure that we are conscious and adapt our policies and measures to this type of issues. A gender mainstream approach is a little bit more broader than that. There, it's really about action and making sure that you are not addressing issues of women, or men for that matter, in an isolated matter. But did you look at it as a, an effort where all have a, a role to play, both in the development of the process, but also as beneficiaries? Next. So there's no such thing as a gender neutral policy or measure. So who decides on water allocation? Uh, why are we not treating our uh, beneficiaries the same as our kids? And we make sure that they know how to use the infrastructure they get. How is it that if women are planting trees, we only see the women planting trees, but don't see it as part of, for instance, resource um, uh, management? Numbers only do not tell the story. Women in the water boards, yes, 50%, absolutely great. But not if that means that they are just sitting there and others decide during the meeting. So it's also about the roles and not just about the numbers. So in essence, if you mainstream everything, basically you're losing everything. And a gender main, mainstream policy in itself is not enough. We have to implement. One of the other aspects that, for instance, Michaela will talk about later is also about big data. We see things from a, a far away, even out of space, but did we actually ask the women in the local population? This is about the validation of data, but it's also about collecting citizens' data. Next. So, women are not just the water carriers. Especially in traditional communities still, women are the guardians of the water resource. But looking at it from an economic point of view, in a lot of cases, millions of women are unpaid suppliers of ecosystem services, services to the ecosystems. Um, of being the water provider, but they're unpaid. So economically, this is unsustainable. Women are also the main consumers. They influence quality, regulations, because they're the users of the taps and the bottles. And last but not least, more and more women have professional education in the field. They are experts and professionals. But again, here, there is the back stick to it. They're regularly not in decision-making positions, not making a career, and they will disappear after a few years. And believe me, that's not because they got pregnant, but because they wanted to be uh, recognized in their professional capacity. Next. So, water is a gender and a women's issue. Women hold positions where they can influence water use. Look at the numbers of the actual workers in all these different areas. They do own and operate small businesses. And what is also important to remember is that they may have other priorities when it comes to water allocation. Next. So what's the difference? This is a bit provocative, a provocative, and I know, but a little bit black and white. But it's just to get you focused. Women, most cases, see the impact on the livelihoods first. 
and they tend to look at water as a social issue. Men tend to see the technology first, it's sexy. And very curious, once technology entered into the water management area, uh, lots of men started to uh, want to become water managers and the women lost their status in there. Women tend to see the merit of water, which goes beyond the economic value or the ecological value. Men tend to see more of the market. So consequently, women are more inclined to look at the demand and men at the supply. Next. These are a few other examples of differences. <coughs> And this is not to say it's always true, but this is to say that you have to be very aware that the way people look and experience their, their influence and the impact water has on them is, can be very different. So that when it influences your, your measures, the, the actions you want to take, you have to take this kind of views into account. Next. And a lot of little cartoon. This is about how people hear things. And hearing is something different in some cases than what you actually said. So a few other examples. Other vulnerable groups. This is meant to be um, something to incorporate people and their concerns. But what people hear is, I'm a victim, I'm not an actor. What they hear is, if they say, are being addressed as a marginalized group, uh, we will take care of you, but why you have to say, no, 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 you're marginalized. Most impacted? Yes, of course. But again, also look at the positive side, what can people contribute and already know. Look at traditional knowledge, at, at experience, not just as diplomas. Another preconception is that water is technology, and since women do not know about technology, it's against everything that we stand for when you look at the Dublin Principle. It's not a women's issue anymore. Next. So a few other things that have to do with understanding and language used. Um, women usually tell the stories, and that is nice and very illustrative, but it also means that they do not make enough use of data. On the other hand, numbers do not tell the whole stories. Um, so you need both elements to really know what the impact and the possibilities are. Lack of access to a compilation use of data by women, even if uh, available, is still lacking. And this is one of the things that needs to be addressed also when using the um, indicators and the data to collect gender designated data. And last but not least, it's very necessary to make sure that we have those data to make sure that we don't make the wrong decisions because everybody agrees on paper, but we're not really sure what it means in practice. Next. So just a few ideas to get you thinking on what you can do to actually address some of these issues. Some of it may be in the sphere of training and education, and then especially vocational training in non-traditional jobs. It might be looking at payment for eco-services, but also the services for or to the ecosystems. It might be having to do with making sure that there are safe working conditions <coughs> and not just the uh, equipment that fits the men but is too big for the women. And again, we need the data to make sure that we understand what's going on. Next. So, 
having concluded this part and probably overwhelmed you with a lot of information, um, we're opening the floor for your considerations. Um, and that means that you have two options. Either you already typed in one of your questions or you can raise your, or you can still do that now. So again, on top of your screen, there's a chat box and there is a Q&A box, which you can use to type your questions in. And another option is to raise your hand and then our um, administrator, Evan, will unmute uh, the microphone for you to answer your, to uh, uh, give your question. The floor is all yours. And Lesha, this is Sarah here. Just a quick note before we jump to the discussion portion. Um, there is, we're getting a bit of music in the background. Um, I think everyone should be muted, um, but I'm not sure if, if you hear it on your end, Lesha, as well. Just wanted to know. It's deep silence here. But I'll check again. What is going on? This should be a discussion. Are they talking? Uh, sure, there should be a, um, a question in the chat box. Are you able to do that? So the floor is open. I believe a question has come in through the chat box. Lesha, are you able to see that? Shall we share that with you? Sorry, now I hear background noise. <laughs> um, I see a question from Lilia Benzit. Um, you're asking what kind of data I mean? Well, I see I think I would like to refer to the, the further presentation that Michaela is going to give, um, but it's data on involvement of women in waterboards. It's data on the impact of projects on men and women and youth. Um, so it's basically um, gender, um, income, location, age, uh, desecrated data that can help you to find out what the impacts are, but also to find out what possible contributions of people can be. Was, is that enough of an answer to your question, uh, Lilia? Okay. <laughs> Who wants to be next? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hi, Leisha, Michaela, and other speakers. So this is Spectre from UN Environment in Nairobi. I have a question. Please. Um, so you know, in, in the work that we are doing, trying to promote gender equality in the organization, one issue that we um, come across is that um, our colleagues will argue that although we work a lot on water issues, but we are not really working on water assets. It's, um, we work more on, for example, on water quality or on other quality <coughs> issues. That, um, and uh, because we are not directly working on about women's assets or men's assets to water, and then people argue that gender becomes less relevant. So if you are in that kind of situation, how would you respond? How can we um, help those people to consider gender even when we are not I mean, talking about water assets. Yeah. Well, I, I perfectly understand your your question. Thank you. Um, because lots of people think that gender um, issues are only related to access, which is absolutely not the case. 
Um, so I'll try and give you two examples, and we can deliberate over this whole series more on that. One is, for instance, on irrigation. Here it's about who is actually doing the work, which is most of the time the women. They work in the fields. And it's the men deciding on where the water comes and who irrigates and what of equipment to use. So this is definitely a gender issue. And to see how the experience and the daily work of the women can be much more um, incorporated and done justice to. Um, another aspect is on water resource management. Um, there are a lot of things that women locally do, um, but are not recognized as part of river basin management, although they give a contribution, like repairing the riverbanks or planting trees or making sure there's less waste in the river. So again, there are roles of women that are not seen as part of the official policy or the official work but need to be looked into and, and become part of the plans. Does that answer part of your question? Yeah, I think these are two very good examples. Thanks a lot for, for the insight. Um, yeah, I think that answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. I see Victor. Yes. You were just speaking? No, I finished. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Any practical questions on what um, Sarah and uh, Michaela presented on the whole program? Lesha, we do have one question that I think came in on the chat box um, from Raul. I'll just go ahead and read that. And Raul, if there's any clarification, please do let us know. The question we have um, is, is the Network Gender Task Force a unit that, for example, Jeff Projects can connect with to get inputs and advice on the efforts we are doing to address gender issues? And I think if I understand correctly, Raul, that may have come in um, as I had mentioned, WWF Gender Task Force. So I'm going to let uh, Natalie, our gender specialist with WWF, address the, the answer a little bit. Thank you, Raul, for your question. Uh, so to clarify um, a little bit, uh, to make your, your, your question uh, a, bit, a bit more um, uh, clear is that when Sarah talked about the gender task force, that was relating to the WWF network gender task force, which is a resource group within the network, <coughs> which can support Jeff projects, but not just specifically Jeff projects, also GCF, USAID Foundation projects that we have within WWF. Um, and, but as you maybe know, the Jeff Secretariat has a gender unit with specialists who can give some advice and provide advice on um, gender issues within projects. And they also, um, the Jeff Secretariat also taps into the expertise of the implementing agencies through um, a, a group that, that comes together uh, from time to time, um, including the, the agencies, also the, the partners through meetings and um, resource sharing and exchanges and so on. So you, if you want to have some, um, uh, some support, some advice from uh, the GEF, you can do that through the, GEF, the gender unit at the GEF. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, yeah, it was good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. Um, there is a second question on measure data in the project. I think I will um, uh, tell you that Michaela will come back to that um, in the next presentation. And then, of course, if there are still more questions, we're happy to answer them then. Um, the second one is, could you address the elements of women in marine resources management and fisheries? 
Um, well, I'll give you also because of time one L, um, um, example. Um, there are, uh, for instance, projects. And there's somebody typing very loudly. Mute your phone. Um, um, where there are traditional roles for men and women in fisheries. Um, and that can go from the men going out in the boats and the, the women cleaning the, um, uh, the fish. Um, but in some cases, because of also the changes in, in climate and roles, uh, women are now, for instance, breeding fish. So there are examples of that, for instance, in Lake Victoria, where actually the gender roles changed because of that. Um, and I'm quite sure there are also um, examples of me marine resources. So um, here I have to admit I have no one um, immediately um, at hand unless one of my colleagues has. And otherwise we'll come back to you on that. Um, Lesha, maybe I can uh, I can answer the question about the data because I'm going to talk about gender analysis and uh, and uh, um, sex disaggregated data um, <clears throat> in a minute or so. But uh, I think that in particular the questions are regarding the, the 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 kind of data that could be collected, and this will be the topic of the next next webinar, the one that is planned for uh, to, to be done in April or May. But I, I can anticipate just a few words on, on this information, on the, on the type of data. And I think that with this I could answer Lilia and, and also uh, the gentleman from, uh, from Guatemala. Hmm? So what, um, what we, we do uh, at WAP is, uh, um, is, is a focus on the uh, sex disaggregated water data and uh, we built a toolkit in order to uh, perform the gender analysis and have a gender uh, water assessment. And, and monitor, or monitor of course. And uh, this uh, could be done with the help of uh, key indicators that they are gender sensitive. So whenever you have to work in a project and apply the gender analysis, which is very important at the very beginning of the, of the project, whenever you have to start with the assessment, with the uh, diagnostic analysis of your project, it is very much recommended to apply also the gender analysis and try to collect sex disaggregated data. And of course, the, the way in which you start the, your, your collection depends on the, on the project. So the recommendation is that you have to uh, um, design and tailor your um, uh, survey and collection of the information based on the goal of the project on the, the, the scope and, uh, and also the dimension of your, of your project. If the project is a regional project, is it of course a transboundary, but it is very large. Um, it involves uh, communities, it involves, involves uh, institutions, uh, transboundary institutions, maybe commissions. So these are the, um, the, the aspects that you, uh, you, you have to look at. And based on that, based on this um, analysis of the situation, then you can choose uh, a variety of indicators that could be the, 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 um, uh, the instruments to collect the information that you need. And with okay, this, thanks, uh, Michaela. Okay. Um, and I just put a reference in the box. Um, the toolkit and the methodology that Michaela is uh, speaking about is uh, freely open source available and we will give you the link at the end of this presentation and on the dedicated website. Um, yes, hello, Lesha. 
Yes, please. Hi, uh, this is Sansi Bruma from the Global Water Partnership Mediterranean. Uh, thank you to all for this uh, great opportunity and thank you, Lesha, for a great introduction and uh, actually provoking us with some uh, specific information. Uh, if you would allow me, I would like very briefly just to touch upon on the uh, preconceptions part that you referenced and yes. uh, just ask if there is any indication from the work that you've done or from other colleagues where improvement, improvement in the workplace for women have actually resulted in some form of behavioral change for them, some, to something that um, ascribes more to the male, let's say, attitude or male reactions uh, with regards to water and um, the re reflections and uh, the way that they behave and they act and they take measures. Uh, I'm, I'm just asking because the work that we are doing at the moment uh, with regards to water integrity uh, has signaled that given the opportunity, women can actually behave and can, can, um, can uh, basically do exactly the same thing as their male colleagues if they have, you know, the means and the power to do so. So I'm just wondering if it makes any difference. Um, Auntie, thanks. Um, and good to see you here. Um, no, I think it does, it really does make a big difference. Um, and I'll, um, I'll make, make it very short because we're uh, a little bit behind us, getting a little bit behind our schedule. Um, if you look at the um, um, participation in, um, in management and in also technical jobs in some of the, the utilities around the globe, then you see that when they had improved the working conditions, so for instance, making sure that we would also have made to measure equipment um, to be able to go out in the field or do technical work, um, or when there was a real acknowledgement that there was no difference between the two by giving them both uh, the same opportunities in their HR policies, that you see the number of uh, women in those uh, companies and those uh, utilities grow. Um, and um, let's, I think it's a very good question. So I'll, I'll see with my colleagues how we can address that a little bit further uh, at another moment because I think it's a very valid point. And I would like to react to one other that I saw on wastewater issues. You're absolutely right. Vigur, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, that a lot of people don't pay enough uh, attention to that. Um, there was even enough, uh, a lot of uh, debate on whether there were even gender-related issues at all uh, when it comes to wastewater. Um, but I think there are two elements here um, from two very different angles. One is that some of the um, elements that we have in our water really impact um, women's health in the long run. Um, and there I'm, I'm talking uh, pollutants like hormones, medication, fertilizer. Um, but at the same time that there are women who are very, very instrumental, for instance, in cities to help collect waste, to make sure that toilets are built, um, which brings down the pollution of groundwater, for instance. So in both cases, women play are impacted or play a big role. Um, and that's another topic we might want to put on our list to think about a little bit more. Um, having said that, I would like to, to close this part of our session um, and go back to Michaela. Um, to present a little bit more on the gender analysis she was already referring to. And thank you all for your very, very good uh, questions and uh, involvement. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Leisha. Thank you all. Okay, we, we go on with gender analysis. We have seen with Leisha that gender definitely matters. And it matters especially in our case with water, when we deal with water sanitation provision and security, and, and also that women empowerment matters when we deal with management of water resources, participation, sharing, and also leadership. Indeed, incorporating 
gender in water policies and project matters because promotes gender equality, enhances effectiveness of IW project in sustaining livelihood and ecosystem, and strengthens the basis for transboundary cooperation. In this part of the webinar, I would like to focus on the important concept of gender analysis and its application to the GEF IW project and discuss why and how we should apply the gender analysis in the international water projects. Um, first, we need to know what gender analysis is. It is an assessment. It is an assessment exercise to understand the differences and similarities between women and men with regards their experiences, knowledge, conditions, needs, and in our case, their access to and control over water resources, of course, and access to development benefits and decision-making powers. The analysis provide understanding of gaps and disparity, which is another important aspect that we have to take into account. And also, if the analysis is very well done, you can also know about why and how they occur. The fundamental elements of the analysis are, of course, data, organized and compared in a very systematic way which provide information about gender relation between men and women, in our case related to water, like access to water, management of water, related to sanitation as well. The most effective way uh, to carry out a gender analysis is to develop the sex disaggregated data collection, and we started talking during the discussion. That means that data are collected and presented separately on men and women. Why it is so important to collect the sex disaggregated data in water management? In this slide, I wrote uh, five good reasons why we shall collect sex disaggregated data. And if you read them, you can easily understand how powerful this analytical tool is. It is able to provide the crucial information for setting up gender transformative planning and programming and gender transformative policies and strategies at all levels, from very small communities to governmental institutions to transboundary uh, bodies. Using sex disaggregated data makes the difference between women and men explicit so that programs and projects can build upon effective actions that promote equality. It is uh, a way to make people that are not counted finally counted and visible. And if they are visible, their lives are visible and improve, health will improve, the economy will improve, and poverty will diminish. So the lack of sex disaggregated voter data is a major obstacle to the conduct of gender analysis. And you can see from the slide that the gender statistic related to water at global level is very low, 37 this year in percentage. And this indicator access to, uh, to clean water has the fourth lowest percentage among 22 global indicators. To fill the gap, uh, WAP has developed a methodology and a toolkit on sex disaggregated water data. The WAP toolkit consists of four elements. The first is a methodology for collecting data. The second is a, le a list of gender sensitive key indicators. The third uh, are guidelines for data gathering. And the fourth is the, the questionnaires for field survey. So as I said before, the webinar plan for April, May will focus on the use of the WAP toolkit, on the use of the key indicators, and so we will treat the topic with more detail and, and, and please don't miss it. Um, next, yes, yeah. Now that we are more familiar with the gender analysis definitions and tools, 
Um, we can examine the JEF uh, IW projects and their approaches. To this purpose, uh, I'd like to share with you a few results of our research, bibliographic research, um, that pointed out that GEF 6 programming direction paper and six covers the period, as you know, between June 2014 and June 2018, as the first time identified the gender consideration as a strategic priority for the international water portfolio to ensure that gender perspective is successfully incorporated into the GEF project design. This is actually a, a quite a, an important step ahead because in the previous cycle, the fifth, uh, covering um, the period between 2011 and 2014, only 35%, 35% of all GEF projects were found to address gender mainstreamings. And these are the, taken from the overall performance studies number five. But, According to the IW uh, study, can you go back again? Thank you. This is the last, uh, the last part. Uh, according to the IW uh, study 2016 of the GEF Independent Evaluation Office, the situation has improved. And uh, I quote, gender is considered in all the GEF 6 project proposal. The concepts do mention mainstreaming, assessment, and disaggregated indicators, although do not contain details on activities or methodologies. So as you can see, the context is very favorable, and this webinar uh, series, I think, acquired particular relevance. In other words, conditions are ripe for the full integration of gender analysis in international water project. Next. What you see here in this slide are about 60 uh, GEF projects, the last approved as of June 2015. Can you click again? All right. The project in the red box are those approved during GEF 6, and they all incorporate gender consideration. They are approximately 10. As you well know, GEF projects follow different ways and approaches. Um, there are the foundational pro uh, projects, this is one type of project, and uh, these are focused on creating an enabling environment for transboundary cooperation in shared water body. They adopt the TDA, the Transboundary Diagnostic Analysis, and the SAP, Strategic Action Program process, that help building trust among countries through joint fact funding and lead to consensus on needed priority remedial uh, actions. Then there is another kind of uh, type of project, uh, which is the demonstration project. Uh, these are projects and programs aim at demonstrating the feasibility and effectiveness of new practices, technologies, and approaches in water resources use management and protection. And the third type is uh, the full-fledged initiative to reverse uh, degradation trends and enhance climate resilience in transboundary water bodies through investment and policy, legal, and institutional reforms. These are the so-called so uh, SAP, or Strategic Action Program uh, um, uh, Implementation Project or programs. In all these cases, gender analysis using sex disaggregated data would be essential to introduce elements of gender consideration to improve women empowerment and gender equality and to enhance the overall effectiveness of the project. Next. So that means that, again, gender analysis and sex disaggregated water data collection are relevant for all IW projects starting with those foundational projects adopting the TDA SAP process as essential part of gender mainstreaming. Can you move to the other one? This is uh, a very important slide, I think, because it is an example. So we make an example of main, mainstreaming gender in the IW project. 
and uh, 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 we focus on the foundational project because this is the most suitable for this exercise. But similarly, gender mainstreaming may be applied for all type of project. So if you uh, look at the column on the on the left from the bottom up, a foundational project offers the opportunity to raise awareness on gender issues and equality and perform a gender analysis based on a collection of sex disaggregated data as part of the TDA. And I'm sorry, it is from the up to the bottom. Um, so that's, this is the TDA part is, uh, is the perfect part of the project in which you can, you can actually uh, carry out a, a sex disaggregated data collection. Based on the gender recommendation emerging from the diagnostic, from the gender analysis, so you can introduce institutional and policy reform as part of the SAP and promote policy harmonization across boundaries. The expected outcome of this set of actions will be enhanced recognition of gender roles and empowerment of women in water management, which in turn is expected to improve IWRM and transboundary cooperation. We have seen that gender consideration is moving its first steps in project design in the GEF International Water 6 proposals, but most IW projects do not include a systematic gender analysis. As the experience and recognition of the benefits to be derived from incorporating gender in IW projects will grow in the portfolio, it might become necessary to retrofit gender mainstreaming in some projects, in particular foundational one, exactly as, uh, as uh, they did recently with climate change impact and forecast that have been integrated into new IWTDA and action programs, or they have been retrofitted into already ongoing or uh, completed projects. And with this, I have completed this part, and I, uh, I, I give the floor back to Sarah to continue with the next topic. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. So I know that we've covered a lot in a short time. Um, just to reassure all of you that this is just the beginning of conversation with us. It's great to see there have been a lot of questions as well. So look forward to hopefully, hopefully more coming up with all of you. We do have five more webinars, which Michaela walked us through earlier. Um, as a reminder, we will have two more face-to-face -face workshops. These are planned for the coming year, for 2018, um, as, we, as a follow-up to the webinar series. Right now we are planning for those to be held one face-to-face -face workshop at the World Water Forum in Brazil next spring, and another at the upcoming Jap International Waters Conference. So we look forward to the chance there to engage with hopefully many of you um, and others in a deeper way at those workshops. Um, and then there is one other possible opportunity we wanted to be sure to mention, which is um, there is a twinning component under IW Learn. Under this, there may be some budgetary resources to support specific assistance provided upon request from projects and stakeholders. There's a possibility to organize ad hoc twinning exchanges based on proposals submitted from the IW portfolio directly. And both WAP and WWF are happy to discuss the possibility of twinning arrangements with any projects who might be interested. If you feel you need specialized or one-on-one -on -one support and guidance on involving women or how to address gender issues and interested IW projects, please feel free to reach out to myself and to Michaela if you are interested in talking about what that possibility might look like. Or, of course, feel free to, to use the chat box and we can follow up with you directly. Um, and, of course, it's possible in that kind of setting to go into much greater depth than in webinars like this or, in fact, even in workshops. So it could be something that's very interesting for those of you who feel ready to engage on a, a deeper level. And with that, um, we do have a little bit more time. 
we wanted to give you a chance to ask any additional questions or share any comments um, based on Michaela's presentation or on these plans going ahead under the IW Learn component. Um, and while you are um, sending those, putting those in there, there were a couple of questions that we couldn't get to in the earlier discussion portion um, that I, I wanted to go ahead and put out there now. Um, Lesha, I think if you are unmuted, it would be great for you to answer. Um, the first is one that came from Tanya. Tanya had asked, what would you say are the main gender considerations in the management of international and transboundary waters? Lesha, I know that's an area you certainly will have some, some feedback on. So I wonder if you might address that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite topics, Tanya. Um, <laughs> um, I think there, there are two elements here. One, of course, is that we sometimes get confused when we hear transboundary, um, although the, the issues are very similar to, to resource management in general. Um, and here, again, we tend to, to feel that there is a boundary, although there's really not. Um, Having said that, uh, I think one is definitely a governance issue. Um, again, here, when there are um, joint mechanisms for cooperation, uh, usually the women are not involved, and especially the women actually living at the borders are not involved. So one measure here that is rarely taken um, is to also look at incorporation of um, women and their issues in the uh, transboundary joint mechanisms that are that are there. Um, a second one that plays a very big role is that again the the women in in those areas where the actual administrative or national borders are um, tend to not look at it from that perspective. Um, they look at um, the, the women just across the river or, or uh, two kilometers up or downstream. Um, so there what happens with uh, local measures and, and, and cooperation between women uh, groups can be very, very um, uh, effective. And there are, there are some very intriguing examples of that, um, especially in Eastern Europe. Um, having said that, there will be the last seminar uh, 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 in the webinar in the series will be specifically addressing this issue um, in February 2019, which is far away. So if you want to follow up on that discussion in, on an earlier stage, we can see how we can do that. Um, then I saw a, a question from uh, Raoul Glossbach. Um, I tried to already uh, address part of it in the in the box. <clears throat> um, there um, are colleagues that work on disaster uh, prevention and disaster mitigation can be really helpful. They have um, developed quite a lot of strategies and activities that specifically address uh, the role of communities and women in this type of circumstances. Um, there's lots of very good material there. Um, and if, if it's difficult to find, we can direct you to that. Um, but the essence there is coping strategies, um, and one of them is to give alternatives, because that's usually one of the biggest problems, that you can warn people, but if they have nowhere to go, then they stay where they are. Um, so that would be my first two responses to that. But again, a um, very good question and very intriguing uh, topic and one to, to look into uh, a little bit further as well. Um, and Sarah, did I miss out on one other? I think we had one earlier uh, from Ahmed um, who asked that we tried in our case in Egypt to involve women, but because of traditions, they were not able to voice themselves because they were embarrassed. How can we overcome this issue? Ah. Well, um, Ahmed, um, of course, I don't know what specifically you did in your project. So, um, 
I'm, I'm just give you my experience and then you conclude for yourself whether that was something you already tried and didn't work or have not tried and maybe want to try in the future. Mm -hmm. um, one is that the embarrassment is usually not there if you address the women uh, by themselves, so in a specific uh, meeting for the women and being conducted by a woman. Um, that usually already helps to make it um, easier to discuss. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also perceptions from our side. Um, we usually presume that the reason they're not speaking up is because they might feel embarrassed. Um, but sometimes yeah. the reasons are very different. Um, so there, um, uh, a gender analysis or, or a further discussion can also help to bring the um, the real issue um, uh, uh, in the open. Um, there are plenty of examples there where where people told me that they thought and they were told that this was the issue, um, but that uh, in the end, when talking to the group separately or with uh, female um, uh, facilitators. Um, the conclusions could be very different. So, um, if you want to address this very specifically, because I don't know your project, unfortunately, um, we can figure out how to do that, but that would be my first inclination um, to answer your question. Thank you so much for the, for the answer. And uh, yes, we tried some of what you have said, and uh, actually, uh, they, their, their performance with women instructors is much uh, better, and I think they, this is uh, uh, explains the, they, they are, were in Paris because they are not get used to to voice themselves in a common meeting or uh, uh, yes. yes, that's why. We, we wanted to give them more trainings on how to uh, uh, voice them, their problems and uh, voice themselves in such water user organizations. But up till now, the, the few of them were able to be, to have an active role in this kind of water user organizations. Well, I, I, I perfectly understand the, the circumstances and that it's not easy, um, but there are some coping um, uh, strategies for that, also from experience of, of others, so an exchange on that might also be of interest to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think there's, there's one more um, that came from Stefano for you, specifically Michaela. Mm -hmm. Stefano asks, in a project that was not designed to conduct gender analysis for baseline, does it still make sense to collect information on how gender responsive project activities are? In other words, methodology and process indicators before disaggregated data on impact. Yes. Michaela, you'd like to address that maybe? Yes, I can address the, yes. Uh, hi Stefano, thank you for the for the for this question. Yes, as I as I said before, I think that uh, it would be important to apply gender analysis also for those projects that were not designed at the very beginning to have uh, to have this um, uh, this part included and uh, because I don't know exactly what what kind of project you you have um, but in in any case uh, if you plan to have actions for the you know like like uh, Similar to the the SAP, the the, the uh, strategic actions that you plan, then it would be very important to get um, information from gender analysis in in order to inform the uh, the, the policies and eventually um, make some kind of a transformative change. Um, with this, I think, that, but it is very general, of course. I think, uh, Sarah, that the best way to go ahead with this is to maybe to have a, a more in-depth conversation with those that are very, very, very much interested in in how to apply gender analysis in another and other tools. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Michaela. 
Um, I think with that, we will, we, we don't want to take too much of, of your time, so we'll continue on. And if there are further questions, again, we are very happy to, um, to follow up with any of you by phone, by email, um, and we'll be sending up follow, uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email that will have all of our contact information again. Um, this is just a note to say that the webinar series will also be providing a library of relevant documents and the reference materials will be available for you to download. Um, you can see on the slide now, you can find them already on WAP's website. Um, you'll be able to find them. We'll send you links where you can find them on the WWF or IW Learn websites as well. Some are there. Some are in the process of being added, so those will, will be followed up on. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning, but these, this webinar and the others in this series will be recorded. They'll also be stored in the same library, so you'll be able to access those or just share them with your partners who you think would benefit from them. Uh, we'll be sharing these links for where to find these on all sites for those who are interested, as well as our contact information by email in the coming week. And again, you can feel free to share all of that with your, with your project partners. These are uh, a little bit of a view of the reference materials that will be collected. So it will include some of the relevant gender policies and gender action plans and guidelines that are already out there, toolkits from, from ourselves as well as a number of the JEF agencies who also have some of these out there. We hope they, they might be of use to you. And with that, I'd just like to thank all of you very much for joining. Thanks to Lesha, thanks to Michaela. Um, thanks for all of you for your interest, and we look forward to hopefully engaging you with you more deeply as the series continues. Thanks so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>